Hi, welcome back to Five Good Questions. I'm your host, Jake Taylor. Our guest today is Ronald Feirstein. Ron was a young lawyer representing Polaroid in its epic patent battle with Eastman Kodak over instant photography technology. He had the unique experience of working closely with Polaroid's founder and star witness, Dr. Edwin Land. This insider access allowed him to write the book, A Triumph of Genius. After leaving the practice of law in the early 1980s, he enjoyed a long and successful career in the entertainment industry, representing artists in music and theater. He's also co-producer of a current Broadway hit. Let's ask him five good questions. Welcome back, everyone. My guest today is Ron Feirstein, author of A Triumph of Genius. Ron, where are we talking to you today? Hi, I'm in New York. I'm in uh, Westchester County, about 40 miles north of New York City. Great. Ron, you ready for five good questions about your book? Certainly. All right. Shoot. So question number one, polarized lenses, instant photography, U2 spy planes, scientific advisor to seven or, you know, five to seven presidents over multiple decades. We're talking about Edwin Land here, a, an amazing American entrepreneur and inventor. How come I never heard more about him until I read your book? Well, that's an extreme, excellent question, Jake. Uh, it's interesting because I will admit that I had never heard of him before I got involved in the in the lawsuit uh, that uh, uh, my book d- discusses. I was on a team of lawyers representing Polaroid, and I had had a Polaroid camera, and I noticed that it said Polaroid Land Camera, but I never knew that Land meant a man as opposed to a... Uh, uh, I thought maybe it referred to the ground. Yeah, don't use yeah. it underwater. Is that what <laughs> exactly. So then I found out that land was the, the father of this technology. And as I got more and more involved in the lawsuit, I learned more and more about him and some of the other amazing things he had done. So it, I, I plead guilty as well as to never having heard of him. But I think there are a couple of reasons for that. I think, number one, look, instant photography is a, was a revolutionary development, and the polarized lens was really a, a revolutionary development. You know, it was a, it was something he invented at 19, and something that had eluded the greatest physicists in the world for hundreds of years. The the, you know, the phenomenon of polarization, i.e., a material that could take the glare out of bright light, had been known since the 17th century, like something like 1640, some guy had started to talk about polarizing light, but they only had big crystals. Land, when he was 19, came up with a thin piece of plastic that could do the same thing. So even though those are amazing inventions, you know, at the end of the day, it's not the telephone, it's not electricity, it's Mm -hmm. not the electric light bulb. So in terms of everyday light, maybe they don't rise to the level of what uh, you know, Alexander Graham Bell or, or you know, Edison, uh, yeah. Edison had done. Um, and also some of the more amazing things he did were done in top secret. Uh, you alluded to the U-2 spy plane and some of these other things. Well, that was a product of some work he did for the U.S. intelligence services, as you pointed out, for seven American presidents over four decades, starting with FDR. He sort of got sucked into the World War II effort. And that led immediately to work uh, with other presidents. When when Truman was on his way out and Eisenhower was coming in, they went to land and they said, you know, we're kind of nervous about what the Russians are doing over there. You know, I, I, I wish I had a better feel for what they were doing. And Land said to him, well, why don't we go take a look? <laughs> and out of that came the U-2 spy plane. So... You know, partly because these are inventions that you know were not as as ubiquitous ubiquitous as they are and were right. not quite the light bulb. <laughs> yeah, so that's a good segue for question number two, and this has to do with. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to give you a little quote, and the the question is, who said this? And it's so we don't do market surveys; we create the markets with our products. Was that Steve Jobs or was that Edwin Land? <laughs> well, that absolutely was Edwin Land, and you know it's so interesting because you know I heard just a few weeks ago Steve Case, who is the new pre- CEO of Apple, he was talking about uh, I guess it was. Um, I don't know if it was the watch or the iPhone 6 or whatever, but their new product. And, and he said, you know, the, the only mission of Apple is to give the world products that they can't even dream of. 
you know? Yeah. And that he clearly inherited that from, from Steve Jobs, and Steve Jobs inherited that from Edwin Land because that was his mantra. You know, that question was asked of Land uh, about market surveys uh, when the SX-70 came out, which was 1972. And the SX-70 camera and film uh, was the system that um, we all think about when we think of Polaroid. It's that square photograph that shoots out of the camera after you snap the picture and it has that big white border at the bottom and it develops right in front of you. Well, that when that came out, you know, that was really an amazing advance in, in technology. And it, it got him on the cover of Life magazine and Time magazine and all. And that's when the journalists asked him, well, how much market research did you do before you started this? Because he had put $500 million of his company's money into it, not borrowing a penny, by the way. It was all profits that they, that they invent, reinvested in this technology. And he said, none. We did no market surveys. We did. We have to give people things that they can't even think of, and that was one of the many things that Steve Jobs inherited from uh, Edwin Land. And and Jobs admitted that Jobs modeled his career after Land. In fact, uh, there are great pictures. If you, if you, the cover of my book has a picture of Dr. Land sitting on the stage in front of the Polaroid shareholders in 1972 when he was uh, introducing this camera, right? Mm -hmm. If you just Google Steve Jobs, and one of the first images that will come up is a picture of Steve Jobs sitting on the stage uh, introducing the iPad. Well, if you look at those two pictures, you will notice that in both pictures, they're sitting on a black chair, and right next to them is a small tulip-shaped table, which is a very famous table uh, designed by Saarinen, the architect, and it's no coincidence that they both had that table because Steve Jobs just modeled off, himself. Huh? <laughs> well, just, it, yeah. it was, you know, it was a complete homage. It was not, you know, ripping him off. He just idolized him and talked about him all the time. Yeah, that's, I found it really interesting, the, the showmanship between both men, um, you know, the secrecy of a big project that was going to be unveiled and then getting the crowd all riled up for it and then a big display, you know, when it's presented. Well, that's where Steve Jobs got his modus operandi from because, you know, I, uh, Land was doing that in the 60s and 70s uh, long before and Steve Jobs thought it was a great way to handle things and, and he followed him. Uh, but they were similar in so many ways. You know, they were both college dropouts. Neither one of them got a you – know, people refer to Land as Dr. Land, but he never even earned a bachelor's degree. He, all of his degrees were honorary. And, <laughs> you know, and they and uh, uh, and they both built amazing technology companies with particular kinds of ethics and, and aesthetics, and they were both, you know, into that uh, – that intersection of, of technology and art, you know, and that was very important to both of them. Yeah. So the segue to question number three, the second half of your book is almost like a class on patent litigation, which I found really interesting uh, as you, you recount blow by blow the case between Polaroid and Kodak. Um, so what what things about patents and patent litigation especially or would be good for the layperson to to better understand well you know it's interesting on several different levels first of all i think that the story is just a great yarn about the relationship of two companies in technology polaroid and kodak over six decades really because it's interesting how their relationship in the beginning was as good as it could be. They really went from a position of mentor and protege to, in the end, complete adversaries. Um, in the beginning, when Land invented his thin plastic polarizer we talked about, in 1930s, his first customer was Kodak. They bought the equivalent of like $100,000 worth of it. That was his first shipment ever uh, in order to make camera lenses, right? A few years later, when Land decided to start doing a little research into photography to come up with the first one-step photography system, who did he turn to? He turned to his friends and his colleagues at Kodak for help. They sent him chemicals and other materials that he used in secret to conduct his research, right? When he came up with the first one-step system, and we're talking now about the mid-40s, he, who did he go to to help manufacture it? Kodak. Kodak manufactured the negative for every Polaroid film starting in the 40s all the way into the 60s 
By the mid-60s, Polaroid was Kodak's second largest corporate customer next to the cigarette manufacturers for whom Kodak made thin plastic filters. Fil fil exactly, the, the little cylinders that would turn into filters. Well, this was a, a, a profitable relationship for both of them, right? What changed? In 1968, Land showed them the prototype for what became SX-70. For the first time, the Polaroid picture did not have to be timed. It didn't have to be peeled apart. didn't have to be treated with a chemical to stabilize it and so on and so forth. When Kodak saw the SX-70 prototype, they said, gee, maybe for the first time, Polaroid is going to challenge us in terms of dominating the amateur photography market. Yeah. And so they, they told Polaroid, we'll help you with this new film, but only – and only if you let us make film for that camera and sell it in our yellow boxes and compete with you directly. Polaroid couldn't abide that. They didn't think they could compete. And so the two companies went their separate ways. In 1972, Polaroid put out their system. Kodak put out theirs in 1976. And instead of leapfrogging Polaroid in technology and coming up with something of their own, it turned out they used some of Polaroid technology, and therefore Polaroid had to sue them. Now, you know, at the end of the day, Patents are really important to technology companies. They invest a lot of money in their technology, and the only way to protect them is to patent them. Yeah. Unless, of course, you have a particular kind of secret that can be tra treated as a trade secret. For example, the formula for Coca-Cola has never been patented. It's never been disclosed. It's, a, it's treated as a trade secret, and no one's been able to figure it out. Fine. But if you have like a mechanical device, you can't really do that, and people are going to be able to reverse engineer it. Mm -hmm. So the patent system is the only thing you can rely on. And the importance of this case is, is, is just seeing how important patents are and how a smaller company can use its patents to protect itself against a larger competitor. And the result um, of this case really represented, without giving away too much of the end, <laughs> you know, uh, so that people can read the book, um, it really rep represented a return to a, pos to a time when patents were important to technology companies. The interesting thing about patents is that they've gone up and down in favor throughout the history of America. You know, the patent system, which we derive from the English, was written into the Constitution and Congress was authorized to create patent laws. And the, the concept is you give an inventor a limited monopoly in, in today, today at 17 years. You get a limited monopoly in your invention in, in return for disclosing it. But for 17 years, you have a monopoly, a legal monopoly. Um, now, unfortunately, it's a great idea because it's supposed to foster innovation. But like a lot of good things, it's been abused. Uh -huh. And companies have used it to create monopolies through other means by, you know, buying up patents or getting patents yeah. through uh, illegal means Patent uh, or improper means. Exactly. Um, which is a different kind of thing. Every patent Polaroid had was the result of their own internal research. They didn't acquire any patents from anyone. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, over the history, at times, patents have been abused, and they've raised antitrust concerns and other kinds of things, on and off. And actually, in the mid-20th century, when uh, Polaroid and Kodak were both trying to, de uh, to develop this technology, patents were sort of in disfavor because of those antitrust concerns, really. Right. And uh, everyone, historically, has looked at the result of the Polaroid case, Polaroid Kodak case as uh, as an event that returned patents to a position of importance, so that small companies, individual technology people, inventors could rely on their patents. Yeah. So with uh, with question number four, Land was was an ardent supporter of the patent system. What was what was the reasoning for that? Like uh, besides just being an inventor and wanting a monopoly, what what was it? What was the genesis for his? Uh, his support there. Well, it's a great story, actually, because what happened was Land was a young man. He graduated from high school at 17. He went off to Harvard. But when he was younger, he had become interested in optics, and he had learned about this whole phenomenon of polarization I had described earlier. And he knew that while he knew that there was no practical material uh, out there that could be used but he could think of lots of applications like sunglasses, like camera filters, and actually a big one that he thought of in the early days was taking the glare out of automobile headlights. Mm -hmm. 
So he, here he is at Harvard, and he got bored, and he decided, you know what? I, working on finding this practical polarizer was much more interesting than anything I could do at Harvard. So he goes home after his freshman year. He tells his father, listen, Dad, I'm dropping out of school. But not only am I dropping out of school, I need $70,000, you know, $70,000 to do these experiments I want to do. Well, like any parent, his father was concerned about this. But interestingly, he wasn't as concerned about the fact his kid was dropping out of college or neither was he concerned about the money. He had the money. He was concerned that when his son solved the problem, he would get ripped off by some big corporation would come along. So he said okay to Edwin. He said, I'll give you the money, drop out of Harvard, fine, go do this, but when you come up with a product, protect yourself. And that's exactly what happened. About a year and a half later, at the age of 19, Land came up with this thin piece of plastic that could polarize light, and the first thing he did was find a patent lawyer. And that started him down the road uh, to protecting himself and all of his inventions because it turned out very quickly that he needed that patent protection because there were others out there trying to do the same thing. And his patent position let him uh, survive against you know, other competitors. Again, he's a 19-year-old kid. He was competing against you know, people in major people in industry, uh, and he prevailed because of his patents. And by the time he was 25, he had a company about the equivalent of a $200 million company built on this invention. Yeah. Well, and that, that started him down the road of being what he became known as the champion of patents. So, question number five um, th this was a huge case between Kodak and Polaroid that stretched over, what, almost 13 years? that it was battled out in the courts. Um, it seems like a settlement would have been much easier for everyone. Why did it, well, how come there was no settlement? Why did it actually go to a decision and so much time and energy and money that went into it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and it was something that I wondered about at the time. I was a young lawyer on the team that represented Polaroid. But, you know, when you're in the middle of a battle like that, you're in the trenches, you're focused, you got blinders on, focused on the case. And it, and it never really occurred, you know, but I did wonder in whatever spare moments I had why we were there and why these two companies couldn't figure it out. And, and it wasn't until I, I researched and wrote this book that I, it, I put the story together and the history that, that I referred to earlier of these two companies and how it evolved. And I think the answer is that at the end of the day, it became more of a grudge match than a rational decision. Uh, Kodak had the opportunity to settle uh, Polaroid at the, you know, um, th there, there were moments, again, I don't want to give away too much of the, 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 the narrative of the book, but there were moments when this could have been resolved without a trial. And I think at the end of the day, Kodak had, had, um, as the relationship changed, the, the relationship deteriorated and there, they grew up some resentment within the upper ranks of Kodak management against land personally as well as the company. And this came from a lot of things. I mean, the fact that maybe Land didn't give Kodak as much credit for the help they gave him over the decades as they sh as he should have. And that that maybe was a legitimate, you know, a feeling that Kodak had. Um and some other things as well. Um and so it really I I believe, you know, and, and that this this became uh less of a rational uh business judgment and more of an emotional uh, reaction and and uh, and and that's why it ended up being litigated. Hmm. So, question number six is always our bonus question, and this has to do with a book recommendation. Yeah. So, what's one book that you've read that you think is maybe underrepresented out there, or was just such a great read that you loved it that we could pass along? Well, you know, I read a lot of nonfiction, and I read tend to read. Uh, in areas of my interest and I happen to be a wine geek <laughs> I love wine and uh, in fact the name of my team in my baseball fantasy league is the winos <laughs> so uh, I read a lot of wine books and um, there's one by a, a fellow named Kermit Lynch um, who started I guess as a wine importer and I guess he still is a wine importer and retailer in California and 
he wrote a book called The Wine Route uh, back in the 80s. Uh, where basically he traveled around visiting various areas in France uh, that produced wine. And um, I feel in, the, in that book, he got beneath the surface of wine appreciation, you know, and, and really exposed the human side of wine production and the, the, the great individuals who are out there trying to make great wine and the things that go into making great wine, as well as identifying the different wine that comes from different regions. Um, and so for someone who wants to, you know, get a little below the surface of what the, uh, uh, of what the, the wine trade, as well as the wine making world is like, I heartily recommend Kermit Lynch's book. Huh, sounds interesting. Got a little different than our our normal recommendation, but I like yeah, to go. It, I like to go a little afield, so that's good. Well, if you're into wine, it's a fascinating book. I love it. Uh, you know, and and he just I think revised it not too long ago, so that there's actually a uh, a postscript at the back updating it 25 years, huh. which which makes it more current. Well, Ron, we really appreciate having you on the show. He's a great guest. Well, I I really appreciate your uh, taking the time. All right, thank you, sir. Bye now.